I'm gonna ask you all about. Um, but I'm gonna try one. So first off, I just wanna introduce both of those running. So we have Steve Novick, the current commissioner. And Chloe Udaley. So my non-funny first joke maybe isn't so funny, um, or not funny, you be the judge. But I woke up this morning and it felt a lot like fall. And I've noticed people have different reactions to the fall. Some people are really excited that the leaves are here, it's gonna be cold, and other people um, really enjoy the summer. So it's just a real softball question. Um, we'll just have you kind of both start with that. How are you, feel how are you feeling about the current season? Um, are you a fall person or are you a summer person? Uh, I think I'm clearly a fall person <laughs> and uh, I maybe I shouldn't admit it but I'm actually really glad that it's not super hot and I can start wearing tights again yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am also a fall person especially when the Washington Nationals are going to make the playoffs and by God this year they will win the World Series <laughs> So I'm actually gonna ask if you all could both maybe stand up here, we could put a chair if you want to sit down. But if there's a way to, yeah, I think that'll work out. Okay, so the way that we're gonna run this is everyone's gonna get two minutes to answer the question, and then when the next question comes in, we're gonna have that same person who answered. So for example, we're gonna have uh, Steve Novick is gonna answer the first question. He's gonna have two minutes, we have a timekeeper, and then he's gonna pass it off to Chloe, and then you're gonna answer the question for two minutes. And then the next question I'll ask, I'll go ahead and answer again, so. Yeah, so I'd just like each of you to introduce yourselves. Um, can you share the moment that you decided you wanted to become involved in politics and how it influences your work today? I, I grew up in a really political family, so I don't remember a time when I wasn't engaged in politics. Uh, my mother came from a radical family in Tennessee. My dad edited an underground newspaper in San Francisco in the 60s. In terms of electoral politics, my first memory is when I was nine years old in 1972, I was a strong supporter of Shirley Chisholm, the African-American congresswoman from Brooklyn who ran that year. Um, but when it became clear she wasn't getting the nomination, I enthusiastically transferred my support to George McGovern. And the social justice commitments of Shirley Chisholm and George McGovern and my parents motivate me to this day. All right, that was really concise. <laughs> so, um, my journey to this run, city council, uh, probably began uh, during my coming of age during the first Gulf War, uh, where Portland earned the nickname Little Beirut. Uh, I also was very involved in uh, the fight for LGBTQ rights, reproductive freedom, and racial equality. Uh, but to be honest, I haven't thought about running for office since I was VP of my freshman <laughs> class <laughs> of high school. Uh, so I think I'm just going to keep this brief since, since Steve kept it a brief. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Sounds great. So housing affordab affordability and the homelessness crisis are reshaping our city. In April 2016, a City Club research committee released a report about housing affordability. The committee's number one recommendation is for the city to dedicate funding to build affordable housing. How would you work to create funding streams for affordable housing? Chloe. So we need to start treating affordable housing for our extremely low income residents as essential infrastructure uh, because it will never be profitable for the private market to develop affordable housing we certainly do need to look at uh, funding streams yes for affordable homes is a great first step which I think we yes City Club just endorsed uh, 
it's a step in the right direction. It will eventually fund 1,300 affordable homes. But um, I also support instituting a linkage fee on commercial and apartment developments to help mitigate the effect of those developments on affordability as well as displacement. But we really uh, have to look at other options besides the funding stream because we are 25,000 affordable units behind. That would include uh, lowering the costs of developing affordable housing, which currently is extraordinarily expensive because of a lot of the requirements that come along with using our public dollars. Um, and in my opinion, it also requires the regulatory tools we need to stabilize our rental housing market right now to keep people in the housing, the affordable housing they're already in. So those would include rent, it's really called rent control, but I've been in council to say rent stabilization <laughs> because it's less threatening to people, especially landlords. Uh, all it means is you won't be allowed to subject your tenants to unchecked rent increases. We also need an end to no cause evictions. Yeah. And Woo! we need to raise our minimum wage a lot faster than the state is currently planning on. First of all, I want to thank the City Club for agreeing that we do need a new dedicated funding source for affordable housing. Um, the same as the City Club did for transportation. A lot of times folks come to us and say, hey, you've got a $500 million general fund. We're sure you're just spending that all on waste, fraud, and abuse. Why don't you just focus it on X? And the truth is the general fund overwhelmingly goes to police, fire, parks, and housing. And people don't want us to slash police, fire, or parks to invest in housing or vice versa. So I appreciate the fact the City Club said we need a new dedicated funding source for transportation and for housing. I agree with Chloe, we have to pass the housing law. That's critical. Um, we've established a couple of small funding streams for housing in the city this past year. We passed a construction excise tax, which the legislature for the first time allowed us to do. The revenue from the tax on Airbnb and the like is committed to affordable housing. And we also are going to take steps, uh, the Commissioner Saltzman is developing a proposal now to develop what's called inclusionary zoning where you require developers building a development above a certain size to set aside some units to be permanently affordable. So that is, in effect, a funding stream. It's a funding stream of the, of the developer's money. Um, I, this isn't exactly affordable housing, but it is homelessness. I recently proposed that we have a higher corporate tax rate for companies that pay their CEO more than 100 times what they pay their average worker in order to fill the gap between what we have... <laughs> In order to fill the gap between the $11.5 million that we spent this year on ongoing funds on homelessness and the $15 million a year that we made a commitment to the county that we're going to spend. Uh, and I agree with Chloe thoroughly on uh, no cause evictions and on rent control. There's all sorts of debates about that, but um, we don't, right now we aren't even allowed to have the debate. The legislature prohibits us from talking about rent control, so we need to go to the legislature and say, look, at least you allow us to have the conversation. So we've got one more housing related question. Um, in early August, Portland City Council voted to lease the former Terminal 1 site in Northwest Industrial District to the Housing Bureau with plans to use it as a temporary 400 person homeless shelter. What role should Terminal 1 play as a facility for people who are experiencing homelessness? And how does this play into the long term strategy to adding, uh, strategy to addressing homelessness in Portland? So, Terminal One, uh, the, as, you, as was noted earlier, fall is coming, the cold weather is coming, we do not have enough shelter beds, let alone enough affordable housing for everybody, and private parties came and said, we think we can raise the resources, private resources, to fund a temporary homeless shelter at Terminal One. And I felt the condition, position we're in, we are not in a position to look a gift horse in the mouth, so I thought that we should give those private parties an opportunity to raise those resources and have another shelter. Long term, I don't know the role of Terminal One. Folks supporting using Terminal One have talked about the Haven for Hope model from San Antonio where they build a big campus um, with shelter and services. 
Uh, Ted Wheeler and I are going to go to visit that next month and check it out and see if it seems to make sense. Uh, if it does, but Terminal 1 is one possible location, but Terminal 1 does have some issues. It's an industrial land that should ideally be used for industrial purposes. Um, so it may be that we follow that model, maybe that we don't, maybe that it happens at Terminal 1, maybe that it doesn't. Obviously, long term, what we want is to have an affordable home, not just a shelter for everyone. Um, so the council made a commitment to, for the next six months, make Terminal 1 available for a shelter, but the long term future of it is really unclear. So Steve and I agree on a lot of things. Um, therefore, I think it's important to really highlight when we don't agree, and we absolutely don't agree on T1. T1 is not a solution. It's not an appropriate um, place for human habitation. And a mass homeless shelter is really a step backwards um, in our approach to homelessness. What's concerning, most concerning to me about the T1 conversation is that a wealthy developer who knows nothing about homelessness, about providing emergency shelter and temporary housing was allowed to circumvent almost entirely our public process. And despite a near unanimous chorus of opposition from housing advocates and providers, from environmental advocates, from social service agencies, from the homeless themselves, got the three votes to move ahead. I don't think it's going to happen. I think the city's going to be sued if they continue to proceed down this road. And the it's very frustrating that we would want to dedicate those kind of resources if they're out there in the private sector. That's amazing. Uh, when it's three times more expensive to serve someone who's in crisis and homeless than it is to get them into supported housing and serve them there. The cure for homelessness is housing. Yeah. Woo! Okay, so we heard a little bit earlier that uh, rent control, or not rent control, I wasn't going to go there, moving to minimum wage uh, was mentioned. So I do have a question about minimum wage. Uh, so the state legislature recently passed a bill that will raise Oregon's minimum wage to $9.75 an hour, as well as there will be periodic increases for up to fourteen seventy-five an hour within Portland's urban growth boundary by the year 2022. Will this meet the financial needs of Portlanders? Should Portland City Council establish a minimum wage that is even higher than the state required minimum wage? No and yes. <laughs> um, so I was really, I was a supporter of 15 now. I was really disappointed by um, the action in Salem to kind of take the wind out of the sails of that movement. It's not enough. It takes, and it take, it's going to take too long. Um, and it also left the preemption on cities raising their own minimum wage in place, which is something that needs to be a legislative priority for city council. How many of you here are renters? So you may be aware that the average price for a room in a shared house is $800 a month now. Um, that's more than the entire house I rented when I first moved out. Uh, in Northwest Portland. Call me a dreamer, but I think if you work full time, you should be able to afford a room in a shared house. Um, so this is also pretty devastating to our local economy. I'm a small business owner, and not only are, is my rent rising, my commercial rents are rising, my employees' rents are rising, and my customers' rents are rising, and it's really having a devastating effect on our local economy. I don't know how many of you here are business owners, but we're seeing a decrease in retail and restaurant revenue from 10 to as much as 25%, and I largely attribute that to our housing crisis. So yes, I support raising the minimum wage with a smarter, swifter phase-in, starting with the biggest employers first, making their way down to essentially micro-businesses like mine so that we can reap the benefits of more money in workers' pockets, which is the only way trickle-down economics actually work, uh, and pay our employees a living wage as well.
1475 by 2022 is not good enough. Um, it's too low and it's too long, as Chloe said. Uh, so I was really disappointed the legislature did not lift the preemption to allow Portland to adopt a local minimum wage. I have to tell you, one of the greatest frustrations of this job is how many things the legislature prohibits us from doing. Uh, they prohibit us from regulating guns or ammunition, by the way. Um, I asked the city attorney, okay, we're not allowed to regulate guns. What if we put a thousand percent tax on bullets? And they said, nope, it's in the preemption. You can't do that. We're not allowed to adopt a local cigarette tax. We're not allowed to allow adopt a local gas tax. Until recently, we weren't allowed to adopt inclusionary zoning. So my all-purpose message to the legislature every session is set our cities free. Uh, so I absolutely agree with Chloe that lifting that preemption and many other preemptions should be a priority. By the way, I was encouraged to see that uh, the governor said that one thing she's thinking about next session is raising the earned income tax credit, which is another way to support the incomes of working people. But we need a faster, higher increase in the minimum wage as well. So as, as it's been noted, Portland is changing rapidly. How would you create economic growth in a way that provides opportunities for all Portlanders, including women, people of color, and people experiencing disabilities? We need to take the impact of women, people of color, and people with disabilities into account with everything we do. Um, I'll give you one uh, significant example. There's been a lot of talk about building a bus rapid transit line along Powell and or division um, out to uh, Gresham. And uh, from a transportation perspective, it's great to have more high capacity transit. But people in East Portland said, if you do not take steps to ensure that this doesn't become a vehicle for gentrification, you might have a fine bus line and there will be rapid d displacement along that line and people who live there now will benefit from it. Um, so they said, we are going to, you're gonna to have to make a commitment to preserve and provide affordable housing along that route before you did it. We got that message loud and clear and we're now talking, thinking about how do we make sure we make those investments in affordable housing and if we can't do that, then, we're, then we would not, not support building the line. Um, we need, as a city, to pay attention to what we're doing as employers and as hirers of contractors. I was talking to Maurice Robbing from the Commission on Equitable Contracting and Purchasing the other day and he said when, when we try to prioritize contracts with women, minority, and emerging small owned small businesses. And he said, you don't just look at whether, you shouldn't look, just look at whether the business falls into those categories. You have to look at the actual workforce. And is the workforce women and people of color? Um, that's critical. We are right now doing a review of our employment of people with disabilities, and it's not that good. And the processes for people requesting accommodation is not that good. There's a proposal gonna come forward that says that there'll be somebody in HR who people who want an accommodation can go to and ask for the accommodation so they don't have to do it through their immediate supervisor, which they might feel uncomfortable doing. Um, one more thing, uh, there's a lot of people who come from other countries who are licensed in a profession in that other country and that license is not recognized in Oregon. We have talked to our legislators about having some uh, re reciprocity with other countries so that people with skills can use those skills. So I'm going to dive a little deeper into one of the issues that Steve brought up. Um, when I got into this, it was really out of my concern for our housing crisis and um, also as a disability advocate, just being concerned uh, how the city is kind of failing our residents with disabilities. Um, however, one of the most interesting and distressing things that I've learned about on this journey is the city of Portland's abysmal utilization rate of women and minority contractors. Does anyone in here want to guess what our utilization rate is? Six percent. Three percent? It's one percent. One percent. Women make up roughly 50 percent of our population, in case you hadn't noticed. Uh, one in three people in Portland are people of color. And, and we know that there is not a dearth of women and minority contractors. They are, that explains that number, they're simply not getting the jobs. We've got to do better than that when it comes to creating economic opportunity for historically disadvantaged population. Um, plus, they do a pretty awesome job. <laughs> So 
So the next question is a very scientific word, seismic resilience. So it's about seismic resilience. Um, Oregon State University geologist and Cascadian subduction zone expert, Chris Goldfinger, has estimated that the likelihood of a magnitude eight or greater earthquake in the Portland area within the, 50, within the next 50 years is 24%. In the event of such a catastrophe, key infrastructure, including hospitals, roads, and bridges could be destroyed. Additionally, there are estimates that there could be at least 20 schools in Portland made of unreinforced masonry, which is more likely to collapse in a large earthquake. Given the pressing nature of so many other issues, such as housing, homelessness, economic development, and uh, equitable economic development, how would you prioritize seismic resilience? And how would you propose policies to better prepare Portland for a ca catastrophic earthquake? Well, this is an area that Steve has a little bit of an advantage of because it's in his portfolio. Uh, so I'm sure he'll have more interesting answers than I do. Uh, it's certainly a challenge to prioritize something that may happen in the unknown hopefully distant future with our most urgent needs such as homelessness and affordable housing. And as I've delved into this issue, I've identified three major areas that we really need to invest in as well as um, some options for funding. So one would be the key infrastructure you mentioned. Um, I think as someone who's really concerned with our Superfund cleanup, I'm also concerned that uh, we have a tank farm next to the Portland Harbor, and if a major earthquake happens and we've cleaned up our river, well, guess what? We get to clean it up again, and this time it will probably be on fire. Uh, so <laughs> I'm interested in looking at using private, private activity bonds to fund that kind of those kind of infrastructure upgrades. For privately owned buildings, I have a supporter who owns an unreinforced masonry, masonry building. That's a hard thing to say. And uh, we've been hashing out some ideas around how the city could better support those property owners. I mean, there's hundreds of these buildings. They will collapse, they will crush people, they will fill our streets and make it hard for emergency uh, vehicles to get through. That's um, something we may be able to address with property assessed financing, which would be a fairly low impact way for uh, property owners to fund those improvements and pay it off over a long period of time. The last thing would be school improvements and you probably need to come through bonds. And I'm a big fan of NET, which is the Neighborhood Emergency Team. I plan on becoming part of mine and we need more funding for that. This is an issue I don't think we have much disagreement. Unreinforced masonry buildings are among the most dangerous buildings. They can literally fall down and cause that injuries and fatalities. We are working on a proposal to require that people retrofit their unreinforced masonry buildings under a certain timeline, and the timeline is different for different kinds of buildings. Um, it will be a major financial commitment for people who own those buildings in addition to the idea Chloe floated one idea we've talked about is when you have an unreinforced masonry building and you would have the right to build a taller building on that spot, um, we would authorize you to sort of sell the air rights to somebody else as long as so somebody else could build a taller building as long as you use the revenue to reinvest in that unreinforced masonry building. We need to talk about incentives for people to make that investment, partly because a bunch of the unreinforced masonry buildings are also l affordable housing buildings. We wouldn't want to tell people to just tear those down and lose that housing. Um, absolutely, on the Critical Energy Infrastructure Hub, um, we, it would be nice if we could just figure out to require the oil companies to retrofit those tank farms so we don't have the river of fire. I think the federal government does have the authority to do that. I've talked to Senator Wyden about that, and he said that he'd be willing to convene a conversation with federal regulators and with uh, the oil, oil companies to talk about how to get that done. Um, we also, of course, need to encourage people to take steps in their own lives, to be prepared, to have an emergency kit, to bolt your house to its foundation. We were lucky enough to get a half a million dollar grant from FEMA to assist people in bolting their houses to their foundations. Um, and that's, that, that's a start. Uh, we need a lot more than that. Um, finally, I just have to tell you that 
possibly the most significant thing that I've done in terms of earthquake preparedness was have a conversation with my wife and her cousin. Uh, because a couple of years ago, Rachel was working in emergency management in the county, and I already had PBEM, and Rachel's cousin Catherine came out, and we gave her an earful about the earthquake, and then she wound up with a job at the New Yorker, wrote this article that drew renewed attention to the issue all around the country, and particularly in Portland. So the lesson of that is never underestimate your spouse's relatives. <laughs> Thank you. So Portland takes uh, a lot of pride in its reputation as one of America's greenest cities, maybe even one of the world's greatest uh, or greatest and greenest cities. Uh, given the uh, global, global nature of climate change, what concrete steps could Portland take to move the needle on this? So we've taken some high profile steps like divesting from agreeing not to buy any more bonds from fossil fuel companies. Um, establishing a policy that we're not going to have fossil fuel export terminals in Portland. But the most important thing we can do is to take steps to reduce our own emissions. And that means continuing to invest in projects that make it easier and safer for people to bike and walk and take transit rather than drive. And the gas tax that the voters passed last May makes some investments simply in repaving the streets, but also makes investments to make it easier to bike, walk, and take transit. Um, we need to continue our, on the path of compact development because although it's counterintuitive, when people live closer together, they use less energy. Because if 7,000 people live in walking distance of each other, a grocery store will spring up to serve them that people can walk to rather than drive. So following our longstanding commitment to smart growth, land use planning is important to climate action. Uh, one thing that I, I have suggested to the head of New Seasons is we all, we all should know that the food we eat uh, affects climate. If you're eating beef, then it takes a lot more energy to produce a pound of beef than it does to produce a pound of lentils. So I actually asked Wendy Colley at New Seasons, why don't you put up big charts on the wall showing the carbon content of food? And she seemed to think that was an interesting idea, and I'd like to see that spread around. <laughs> Again, I don't really disagree with anything uh, Steve said here. It's an area that he's had a chance to delve into a lot more than I have. I would like to mention, as far as wanting compact neighborhoods and reducing our own emissions, that our own public employees are being forced out of the city due to rising housing costs. Uh, I was at the Labor Day picnic yesterday. I talked to someone that had moved to Camas someone that had moved to Gresham, and someone that was commuting um, all the way from Salem for their job uh, as a city employee. So housing really is an essential part of our conversation around climate change. I was thrilled that we passed uh, the ban on um, or saying no to new fossil fuel infrastructure, but apparently, and this is an air, isn't an area that I know enough about yet, but um, we still need to pass a ban on bulk fossil fuel terminals because we can still have fuel coming in that will just dramatically increase our carbon out output despite the fact that we've said no more fossil fuels. We also need to look at a, a plan for 100% Renewable energy powered Portland. Cities. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, you can clap. Yeah. <laughs> Again, an area that I need to dive a lot deeper into, but conversations are starting around the country and around the world, and Vancouver already has a plan. And uh, lately, you know, running for city council, I'm often looking to other cities uh, for working models. And Seattle is doing great with housing, Vancouver with climate change, and I'm feeling a little bit. I'm feeling a little bit jealous. I think we, I think we need to start seriously competing with these people. Yeah. Woo! I'm gonna say go Portland Timbers after that, because we do compete and we we're doing pretty good on the soccer front. <laughs> it's the only sport I like. <laughs> um, so here's another really interesting topic. City Council collaboration. Um, name a specific initiative championed by another member of the City Council that you support. Tell us how you would work with that person to pass it and make it more effective. I 
So my, um, my initiative that I'm championing and will be giving testimony on Thursday is Commissioner Fritz's open and accountable elections. Uh, it sounds like everyone in the room maybe knows what that is, but it's a um, it's another form of publicly funded campaigns. As you know, we had kind of a debacle with our first experiment, and it was voted down by a small margin. And this is a different plan where um, candidates that agree to matching funds would receive a six to one matching, an agreement for limiting their amount raised to I think 250 in the primary and 300,000 in the runoff which is still seems like an extraordinary <laughs> amount of money to me I've I have I have no uh, plans to raise or waste that kind of money on a campaign there's too many important things to be done with our <laughs> resources uh, what that would accomplish would be reducing barriers to people like me and other kind of non-traditional candidates that represent people that don't have a voice on city council right now. Uh, reining in out of control campaign spending as I mentioned and don't entirely agree with and creating an alternative to corporate politics which is what we really need. We need to keep big business out of our elections. We need to stop disenfranchising our voters and we need to stop letting moneyed corporate interests run our city. Yes. Woo! So we have a group of really talented people on the council uh, with diverse and sometimes overlapping, but, but diverse interests. And I was been talking to both Commissioner Fritz and Commissioner Fish in the last week, and I'll have this conversation with Commissioner Saltzman too. I think that we could do a better job of making sure that we all know what each other's highest priorities are. Every week there's something that comes up that, sees, that seems like a big priority. But we need to keep in mind what are the top five things that Commissioner Fritz or Commissioner Fish or Commissioner Saltzman or Mayor like Wheeler cares about so that we can have that in front of mind. Um, and I have to have that conversation with Commissioner Wheeler too. Um, I'm sorry, Commissioner, sorry, Mayor like Wheeler. <laughs> sorry, Ted. Um, so one example of a priority for one of my colleagues that we've all been involved in already and will be involved in over the next couple of months is we, the city council made it a priority in the last legislative session to end the preemption on inclusionary zoning. And Commissioner Saltzman uh, was the loudest advocate for that because he's the housing commissioner, but all of us put it on the agenda. And he has convened a panel to look at how inclusionary zoning has worked in various parts of the country and give us advice on how best to do it. So he's gonna be bringing that forward soon. And I really look forward to looking at the research and hearing from the experts he's assembled and the experience of other jurisdictions and coming out with an inclusionary zoning plan that generates as much affordable housing as possible in as short a time as possible. So that's one example of something that uh, I've, but we've been working on together and I'm really looking forward to seeing to completion. So each of you now has five minutes uh, to give closing arguments or closing statements. We could call it closing arguments. We'll call it statements though. So here you go. All right, I'm not gonna take five minutes. I think we've been at this long enough. Uh, I am gonna depend heavily on my notes because I wrote this about two hours ago. I apologize. So Steve and I both identify as progressives. We both endorse Bernie Sanders and we share concerns about a lot of the same issues. In fact, I voted for Steve twice. Not this last time though, just FYI. <laughs> he seemed like my call kind of politician and you know maybe he is but I I expected someone with a strong background in environmental and labor issues to advocate for the environment and for labor and I expected someone who would stand up for the little guy to be willing to listen to constituents more than developers polluters and corporate PACs being a lifelong Portlander, and Portland being the kind of place it is or was, it wasn't until recently that I realized, hey, I'm the little guy. <laughs> because the city where I was formerly able to build a good life for myself and my family, doing meaningful work while earning a modest income, 
has changed so rapidly over the past few years that I find myself struggling to make ends meet and stay in the city that's always been my home. I don't feel heard, and I certainly don't feel stood up for. If you're focused on people, and in a way, Steve, this is a love letter to you, if you are reelected, you are gonna, this is not the last time you will hear from me on this. <laughs> If you're focused on the people who can afford to give large campaign contributions, you lose sight of the people who can't. I'm running for the people of Portland who also aren't being heard and who aren't being stood up for. I've taken a page out of the Sanders playbook and pledged to keep big business out of my campaign and have urged Steve to do the same to no avail. When I step into office, I want the people of Portland to know that they put me there not moneyed corporate interests, and that I am beholden only to them. I will certainly take into account the interests of business, big business, being a business owner myself, but I will always put our people before their profit. Due to the high barriers of running for city council, we have a council that, while they may have diverse interests, they vastly overrepresent a small but privileged segment of our population. Yes. <laughs> We need more diverse representation on council in order to ensure that the needs and challenges of our residents across the city, including East Portland, are known, understood, and served. I stand to be the only East Side resident on council, the only renter, the only small business owner, and the eighth woman to ever serve on city council in over a hundred years. <laughs> first step in the right direction, a direction that will bring more women, more people of color, and others who have largely been excluded from our political process. That is my goal, to serve the people and to open the door to my more diverse representation so our entire city can thrive. Let's make Portland work for all of us. Go Chloe! Go! So there's five issues that keep me up at night. One is global climate disruption. Uber. One is economic inequality. One is our crumbling infrastructure. Another is rising healthcare costs. And more, a more local issue, the earthquake. And I ran for city council because I thought this is a job where you can take steps at the local level to address those issues. And I came to city council as a guy who'd been an advocate for years and years in Portland politics. And I came to the job really eager to get a lot of things done. And I have to say that the first half of my term, I often got kind of impatient. And sometimes it wasn't all that easy to work with. But over the past couple of years, I have learned that through patience and partnerships, you can get a lot of stuff done. And I'm pleased with the things that my fellow council members and I have been able to do on some of those issues. Uh, I collected a broad coalition of labor, business, environmentalists, social justice advocates, and traffic safety advocates to pass the Fix Our Streets gas tax measure for street repair and traffic safety, something the city has needed to do for 30 years. <laughs> Fixing our streets, obviously that's a way of addressing our crumbling infrastructure, but making investments make it easier for people to bike, walk, and take transit also enables people to reduce their carbon emissions. And also, if you're biking and walking, you're healthier than if you're driving your car. Um, so the Fix Our Streets measure will help keep down healthcare costs. And some of the most dangerous places to bike and walk in the city are in some of the lower income parts of the city. So equity factors into that as well. Um, on the issue of inequality, I was pleased to be part of a council that led by Commissioner Fritz passed paid sick leave for all workers in Portland. I was pleased as the PBOT commissioner to be able to introduce a discounted parking program for low wage workers who work late shifts downtown. And 
one of my one of my highest priorities for my next term is to do something which right now the legislature prohibits us from doing, but the prohibition ends in next July, which is to protect workers from what I call abusive scheduling. Too many workers don't know until the last minute when their next shift is going to be, making it impossible for them to arrange for childcare or otherwise organize their lives. And San Francisco has taken steps to ensure that people get advanced notice for their schedules or extra pay. Seattle is considering a proposal like that right now. I hope that the legislature either passes such a proposal itself or at least lets us go ahead and do it next year. And, and finally, on inequality, my proposal to tax corporations, and have an extra tax on corporations that pay their CEO more than 100 times what they pay their average worker. I think that's the kind of thing, like 15 now, like paid sick leave, that can catch fire and spread from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and shareholders can get the message that their profits are being eaten away by the fact that they are overpaying these CEOs, paying them 300 times the typical worker. Okay. <laughs> On climate, as I said, I think it's important for us to maintain our commitment to smart growth and continue our investments in um, biking and walking infrastructure. One little thing we did in Peabot was we replaced the street lights with LED lights, which use less energy, and that both saves money and reduces carbon emissions. And cause seizures. Um, and on um, on, we've talked about what, we're, what we've done on earth, earthquake preparedness. I should also say that the housing crisis is one aspect of the broader inequality crisis. So all of the investments we've made in affordable housing and the policy steps we've taken are ways to ameliorate the effect of crushing inequality. Because if there was not such a huge disparity between wealthier folks and non-wealthier folks, then the fact that there's higher income people moving to Portland wouldn't have such a dramatic impact on prices. Uh, because people are coming in who can afford far, far more than the people who already live here can. And that's the major reason that I, like Chloe, was a Bernie Sanders supporter. I thought that he was, would do something about inequality, and I thought of other things that would help to ameliorate our housing crisis. Um, so finally, I just want to say thank you all so much. Thanks to City Club for hosting this. This is what makes City, I mean, one of the many things that makes City Club great, and I've been a longtime member. Sometimes I need to be nudged or renewed by membership, I did that recently. Um, I, I want to thank my wife, Rachel, uh, who's here today, and our dog, Pumpkin, who's loyally guarding the house. <laughs> Can we get a round of applause for both the candidates again? <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm going to hand it off to yeah, Mike. I'll just, I'll just